Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining our conversation on Athlete 360. My name is Arjuna Chala, and I'll be the moderator for this session. At this time, I would like to introduce you to Chris Conley. Chris is an awesome person, number one. He's the head training coach at NC State University. So we have been working together for a couple of years on the Athlete 360 project. We've been making great progress. And the project is both unique and very interesting and also cutting edge. Chris has also been presenting the similar topic at many conferences. And I think you'll find it very interesting. We have received great reviews from the other conferences. Now, before I hand off to Chris, um, I just want to ask my first question, Chris, and then you can answer it at the very end of your presentation. I'm an Atlanta Falcons fan, and um, you know we are we are very much in pain nowadays, as you know. <laughs> uh, what I realized was almost every game, the very first half of the game. Uh, you know, they play like the number one team in the world. But the second half, they don't turn up. And uh, you know, after the first game, I realized, you know, something's going on. And you see in the second half, quite a few of the key players in the team are injured after they play the first half, right? And uh, lo and behold, obviously, the performance lacks quite a bit when their main players are not playing in the second half, right? So it looks like there has been problems in their training or you know, they haven't trained enough or you know, they're not being uh, coached uh, correctly uh, during the game. Uh, so allow your input on this subject. So I'll hand off to Chris. Take it from here, Chris. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah, for sure. I think it's a definitely uh, interesting question. There can be a lot that plays into that sort of thing, but I think it's uh, it's also something that's pretty applicable now with everything that's going on with uh, COVID-19 being such a big thing and affecting how sports are able to kind of return to normal and, and have their players ready to go uh, as if it was a normal season. So. I'll definitely get into some stuff that could be along those lines once we get going here. Um, but yeah, thanks for the intro. Um, and we'll get ahead now. So uh, the goal with this project is really just kind of help us, our athletes, our coaches understand uh, what happens with these athletes on a daily basis, kind of normally through training, through everything that can affect how they perform when they have to go out and do it on the field or, or wherever they perform, depending on their sport. So we have data coming in from a bunch of different sources, whether it's their performances on the field, in games, in training, in the gym, whether it's data being collected from different pieces of technology or anything like that. Uh, but how do we now take all this data and make sense of it or, or use it in, a, in an impactful way? Uh, so the goal of this was to create kind of what we would call an athlete management system. So we want to take the data from all these different sources, bring it together into one place so that we can have a little more of a comprehensive analysis and try and kind of create one big, uh, you know, all pieces brought together into one big puzzle that we can then try and get the most information out of to change how we can provide service to the athletes and help them perform. And then kind of ultimately, after we kind of bring all these pieces in that kind of play into the puzzle, how do we then use that to then improve our process as we move forward? So one big thing is trying to then take our data and use that to our advantage moving forward, learn kind of the trends we've seen before, different things that happen uh, you know, when athletes go through training or they go through competition and how we can use that to better understand what may come next or how we can improve our approach to kind of improve the outcomes down the line. Um, so again, lots of data coming from different sources. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail just because it's going to be a lot of information being thrown out. So kind of the main different categories of data would be readiness data, training load data, and performance data. The main differences being readiness data is kind of what we use 
more in the frame of how do they look right now compared to normal. So if we perform a test in the gym or we have them fill out a questionnaire, we get that data and we can then say, all right, how does this compare to their recent trends? How does this compare to where they normally are or where we want them to be? Uh, training load data being kind of the amount of work they're doing on the field or in the gym, uh, being measured by GPS or again, some more questionnaires that they'll fill out after a training session. And performance data being kind of how we track them over time in the sense of, are they getting any better? Are you know the physical characteristics that we're trying to train to improve their uh, kind of capacity to play their sport? How can we measure those and then kind of track them over time to try and actually understand whether or not we're improving those characteristics? Or uh, if we aren't, then what can we do next to try and do so? Uh, so one of the biggest pieces of technology we use is stat sports. So that's kind of who provides our GPS devices. So in the middle of that picture, you can see a little pod. They'll wear that on the back of that vest as they're out on the field training or in, in the middle of games. And that'll help us get kind of all of our data related to any sort of movements that they're doing, whether it's speed, distance, change of direction, anything like that. Uh, all of that data is collected there, and then that syncs up to a heart rate monitor that they'll wear. So then that will also provide us with uh, heart rate data layered in with the rest of that data coming in from the GPS. Uh, and then one way that we look at that is we have this beacon set up on the field as we're out there. So as they're playing, we can kind of track their data on an iPad during that session. Um, so you can go back and look at all the different metrics during the session to track how it's going. To be honest, uh, kind of the live setup, the biggest uh, importance for me is really just to check to make sure their devices are on and working properly so that when we get back into the gym afterwards to download the data and bring it into the system that we're not getting uh, kind of useless data or not uh, having data for a specific person because their device was either not on or not working right. Um, so biggest thing there again, just make sure we're getting the data coming in so that when we get back, we actually have the right data to work with. Um, so now I'm gonna share a couple of videos to show uh, just some of the uh, pieces of equipment that we'll use in the gym. Um, so right now I'll show this quick video. This is just showing uh, an example of using our force plates. So here it just shows me doing a quick jump on the force plates. Um, here we have our plates down at the bottom. I'm jumping off of them. This will help us see kind of how much force they're putting into the plates when they take off, how high they jump based on the time that they're in the air, and then how much force that they land with. So. Uh, it's good to track that because normally if you can put out more force, uh, you're able to be a little bit more strong and powerful, which can help you move and perform on the field, uh, as well as having two different plates there at the bottom so that we can measure the force and the impact on both legs. So measuring the difference between the legs when they take off, when they land, whether there's any asymmetry there based on if they're avoiding one leg because it doesn't feel good, or if it's just the way that they're kind of balanced out and maybe we need to look at that moving forward. Um, so the next video is going to be looking at what's called a Nord board. So here we're looking at uh, hamstring force. So similar to the force plates for the jump, but now we're looking at hamstrings specifically. So there's hooks over the back of their feet that will be kind of anchoring them in so that they can use the back of their legs to create force to kind of slow that fall down towards the ground. Um, so that's important because having the control with these muscles on the backside of their legs is very important for soccer players just from a kind of injury perspective. If they can be strong there, then they'll be less dominant on the front side of their legs with their quads. Typically you'll see a lot of times Athletes in soccer will be very strong on the front side of their legs from kicking and all kind of soccer specific motions that sometimes the back side of their legs kind of gets overloaded and uh, doesn't get used enough. So in this case, we can measure the force being put out there. Again, it's two hooks so we can see the difference between the two legs um, to see if there's any important difference there 
for when we want to see, you know, will they be at any risk for injury? Or if it's someone who typically does have that, can we track to make sure that they're uh, kind of looking good right now and their asymmetries aren't in a spot that we don't like? And this last one is just kind of showcasing this little thing at the, uh, on the ground there called the gym aware. So what that's doing right there is it's tracking the velocity of the bar as it's moving through the air during the exercise. Um, this is important mainly because we can track kind of speed and power of movements in the gym um, rather than just using load as kind of an intensity or uh, kind of the work that gets done. We can track the speed and the power of the bar movement so that we can use that to say, all right, how are they progressing from this standpoint, but also uh, are we moving in a way that is a little bit more indicative of what happens in the field? Uh, obviously, movements on the field are very quick and powerful versus sometimes in the gym, it's a little bit slow uh, and controlled when that can't necessarily happen on the field when they're in the game making quick decisions. So can we use a tool like this to kind of uh, give them something else to shoot for in the gym, whether it's a certain speed, um, for a particular movement and then can we have them match that or over, over time can we use the same load and have them try and move it faster uh, as we continue that kind of exercise program. So now going forward, how does, you know, what's the goal of this system that we're trying to set up? We're trying to bring all of our data in again from our different sources, bring it in from the GPS software, from the web portals for the force plates and the NOR board and where their questionnaires come from into one place where we can upload it to the landing zone on the HPCC system server, spray it onto the different nodes of the cluster, and then be able to run our scripts so that we can clean up the data, process the data to get it kind of modeled the way we want it and ready to be, uh, you know, aggregated or manipulated in whatever way we need to do to actually analyze it and report it back to the coaches. The couple points at the bottom are just slightly outdated now and I'll kind of show what the new approach is in a few slides from now, but essentially before we had kind of a couple middleman type processes where we're uploading the data to another spot to then query it from there to create our visuals. Now we have a little bit more of a direct approach where we can pull it straight from the HPCC systems cluster and right on to where we're creating our visuals. Um, so here's just a quick kind of view of a flow of our different data files coming through the system and how they eventually get used together uh, to be able to make some of our kind of final outcome files that will be used in some of the uh, actual visuals. So um, one thing we can do here is be able to kind of look at some of this here uh, at a more specific view. So zooming into just some of the men's soccer data, we have our different data sources coming in. And then we can see here how some of these things will get used together. So in this specific space here, we can see um, a dates file coming in that kind of gives us our season schedule layered on top of kind of our questionnaire data up here and our GPS data here and have those things all play together in what becomes some of our uh, output files that can be used to look at the GPS data and some of our questionnaire data at, in kind of a different lens than uh, just how we see it when it first comes in. Um, so from there, we can then move on to some examples of how the data kind of gets framed. So it comes in in a very basic form. We tell the system what each piece of the data is and how we want to then kind of structure it and model it so that when we go to actually process it and manipulate it to get what we want to actually analyze and understand the data, it's ready to go. We just need to kind of start writing out some of the scripting for that. Um, here is just a quick example of how we took some of the questionnaire data, um, created uh, one field that could be kind of the overall score for this particular data. So this is actually women's soccer data questionnaires, uh, and then looking at kind of an overall wellness score based on how they rated the other categories. Um, 
and then how we process that to kind of replace any days where someone may have forgot to fill out their questionnaire. Um, and then we can make sure that everything is there so that when we go to actually use this data to move forward and create any of our actual analysis that uh, it's going to go the way we want it to go. It's going to be the data that we actually want to look at. Um, and then here is kind of taking uh, the same data and then creating some uh, rolling averages. So in this section here, we're just creating some windows of averages, uh, one being a two-day average, one being a four-day average uh, based on the previous days. So at the bottom, we kind of get a spit out of their overall wellness score from their training load uh, questionnaires. We can get their overall rating of that particular session, and then we can get their rolling averages from the past few days before that to be able to understand, all right, here's where the data is for today. Here's where their trends were leading up to this, this day. Uh, how can then we draw some information from that data? And then just a quick idea of, you know, coaches go out, they give us a training plan, they run their practices, but how do we actually understand what's happening on the field when there's tons of different drills happening, uh, sometimes different drills happening at the same time, all the drills look different, all the drills have different goals and different objectives. So how can we actually then sit down after, understand what was happening during each drill? How does that compare to kind of what they wanted to happen or how do the drills compare to each other in terms of kind of key outcomes or how we can compare them together and understand what are some key differences between them and how that affects the athletes in their training. So just as a couple more videos here, um, we have a couple examples of some things that will happen in a, a particular practice. Um, so here is one example of a kind of more front half of the team attacking type drill where they'll move the ball around the back of the field uh, and kind of work on their patterns, work on how they're gonna move up the field. So they're working on moving that ball across the back of the team. And then while that's happening at the same time, uh, the other group, which is more backside of the team, some defenders, some kind of further back midfielders, will be working on kind of defensive shape and responding to the balls coming in, kind of setting their line and what their objectives are to be in the field, responding to that play. So during a particular practice, if we're having all these different drills and we're having things happening at the same time, how are the coaches going to understand what actually happened during this practice and whether their objectives were met, whether their, uh, you know, keys to the training session were met and how we can actually check those things and make sure that moving forward, you know, everything is kind of on track the way we want it to be. So here we get kind of an actual visual of some of our data coming in as a actual um, kind of daily report. So here I'm gonna kind of show the updated version. This is kind of what it was before, um, but now this is gonna be more so how we're trying to approach it now. So this is within um, a system called Real BI that's now being developed with uh, HPCC systems. Uh, and we can now directly feed the data from the cluster itself. So here we can make a workspace here just for men's soccer that's connected to our cluster. Uh, we can create all of our different graphs and visuals here for the data itself. So we can look at some of our key metrics from a particular practice here, see each athlete's data for that metric, have a quick table to have any kind of overview look at what's happening with these different metrics, how they may compare to normal. Um, and then having that be kind of what comes in each day and looking at the data from each day and then how we can then look back at the course of a week and see how that week actually played out. So this is showing a week view from start of the week to finishing with a game, how the distances played out, training load being from their questionnaire, so how they kind of perceived their effort on these particular days, uh, readiness being their questionnaires in the morning, how they feel, how they perceive their soreness and fatigue and all those things, how they score overall on their questionnaire, uh, and then how some of these other GPS metrics coming in again look. So if we wanna say, all right, well, through the week, we wanna manage our loads so that they're ready to play during the game. We can understand this here. We can see distances are somewhat high at the beginning of the week. They get a day that's a little bit lower. 
again, one more decent day, taper down for the game because the game is a lot of training, a lot of distance, or a lot of stress on the athletes. Here you can see how they felt. So as the week is going, they start to feel a little worse because they're getting tired. Training felt really hard here, so that's why we drop out of it to make sure that we're not overloading them. They feel better here as we're now tapering into the game. And then once we get to the game, it feels like really hard work. And then we can confirm that here with their player loads from the GPS, the actual loads based on a bunch of different metrics coming together. You know, loads coming up, we're trying to manage it. We taper for the game and the game is a massive load that we need to make sure we can help them recover from. And then again, here, high speed distance. You can see how the regular distance and high speed distance sometimes oppose until the game. You know, we saw higher distances here, lower distance here. So when a uh, overall volume of a session gets lower. We'll make sure that there's still some intensity there so that they're not going to fall flat and have it be too easy so that when they get to something that's more difficult again, it's not, uh, again, an overload. So just some quick ways of how we can view that data again uh, and some ways that we're still building it in here. Again, this is like still very much in development and there's a lot of things that we're looking to eventually build with it, but it's a great start for us to be able to kind of make some new visuals with how we report this data to coaches and help them make sense of what's happening. Um, and then from there, we can continue to kind of look at some of our other data. So here, we're looking at um, game data based on different sections of the game. So one thing they brought to us was, uh, you know, they'd like to look at different sections of the game not just first half versus second half, but how the first half within itself plays out, how the second half plays out, depending on different time periods of those halves. So here we split the halves into 15 minute segments. Uh, normally a half is 45 minutes long. The fourth segment there is just kind of spill over extra time because generally it will go a bit over 45 minutes depending on stoppages due to injuries or fouls or anything like that any time that those time kind of adds up and they stop the clock for any reason, that time will then kind of be added on at the end, considered as extra time for that half. So here we're looking at a particular athlete's um, trends through a particular game and comparing that to how the rest of the team looked on average. Uh, we can see each 15 minute period here. So we can see kind of that second 15 minute period in general, this athlete is doing a bit more work than what the rest of the team would be doing. Um, and maybe slightly less during that first 15 of the second half. Um, but in general, we can start to look at some of those types of trends with how the team compares to itself within other games, or also at the same time, uh, how the, this athlete looks through different games. So we can see, all right, what's what's normal for this person? Uh, or what's what's the goal of this game compared to normal? If one game didn't go so well and we saw a trend from that, can we then look to change that trend in the next game uh, by employing a different strategy or, or focusing on some different points? Um, here's a quick view of uh, a learning tree model that we built to try and do some of that predi predictive analysis I was talking about before. I'll go into a little bit more detail on this in a few more slides. But this is just a quick view of some points of the GPS data and questionnaire data that we will use to then try and predict how they will score in their questionnaire the next day. The goal being that um, we're looking at some of our most impactful measures from the GPS uh, being time above 85% of their max heart rate. So basically what we would consider the red zone, uh, how much time they're spending in that red zone, how much distance they're covering, how many times they're bumping into other players or going to the ground or, or having you know physical contact and then looking at their scores from the questionnaire at the start of that day before the session and then some rolling averages based on that from uh, the trends over time before that day and then try and predict, predict how they will now score in their questionnaire the next morning afterwards. Uh, and then here's a view of kind of a idea that we have to redesign our questionnaires. So the way the questions are, questionnaires are currently, um, sometimes some athletes may not fully understand how the scales work. 
or what the questions are truly asking, what we're trying to get out of those questions or how they can understand um, how to kind of perceive how their body feels and then kind of help uh, relay that information to us. Um, so one idea that we're now currently working with is giving this kind of prototype questionnaire to them and having them basically design where these anchors will go on the scale. So they all drag to a certain point on this line where they think a particular descriptor will go. So when we're asking about recovery, where would they place uh, the descriptor very recovered? So if they feel very recovered after uh, a session the next morning, where on this line does it make sense for them to put that? Or when we're talking about training load for a session, where, where does it make sense for them to place uh, low in terms of their overall perception of how heavy that training load was? Um, so that once they go through all of uh, the descriptors we wanna use um, for each kind of category here, how can we then take those uh, responses from the athletes and kind of reweight where these descriptors will go on the scale. So instead of having uh, the, uh, all of them evenly spaced out here, maybe uh, moderately recovered does stay in the middle, but very recovered doesn't happen until here and slightly recovered happens more here in terms of where they feel like that works so that when we then redesign our questionnaires for that particular team, that it can be weighted in a sense that uh, makes more sense to them, helps them understand it better so that uh, in the end, the data we get back is a little bit more uh, in line with how they feel. And we may get a little bit more disparity between days because now if it's hard numbers where there's no real in-between points like this, and it's only on these points here, they only have a number on there instead of kind of a graded scale. Uh, there's only so many possibilities for answers we can get. So when we have it on a long line like this and they can pick anywhere on this line, um, they just pick their spot on the line. But what we see is a, a one to 100 response back. So if they put it here, you know, we might get uh, an 85 or a 90 as a number, but they don't know that. They just pick where on the line makes sense to them based on where these descriptors fall. And then when we get that score back, we can compare it to where that normally is for them uh, and try and create a little bit more uh, of kind of a cleaner data set, but also one that is hopefully more in line with what we're actually trying to get out of it um, and, and be more uh, in line with the information we're actually looking for. Before, there's a question that asks more about their fatigue we found that sometimes they're relating that more to lack of sleep or other things that are unrelated to their actual uh, training load. So when we wanna ask about things that pertain to their readiness to train and perform based on how they feel from previous training, we want it to be you know, related to that more specifically than just kind of things in general. Um, so when we decided to switch up some of the questions, we decided to do more, you know, how recovered do you feel today rather than uh, how, do you, uh, how do your fatigue levels feel today? Because it gets them more in the frame of mind of, you know, how do I feel based on the past training? Do I feel like I'm bouncing back? Do I feel like I'm still kind of tired from that kind of sore? Then, you know, I can have a better frame of mind for how that question is supposed to be answered or what kind of information you're looking to get from that. Um, so then from there, um, getting into some more of the information based on how we apply the data we're collecting to our current situations based on COVID and how that has affected kind of our normal process. Um, so a lot of what has changed isn't necessarily uh, changed our data from a performance standpoint or physical uh, training standpoint. Uh, completely. Some of it has, some of it hasn't, but more of the bigger changes is a little more in just kind of the behind the scenes type stuff. So the guidelines that we have to follow to be able to continue to have our season. So we're already two games into our season. Uh, we had our preseason for a while. We're, we're kind of past the point now of kind of the, 
the physical considerations of how our return to play will have to be different than normal. Um, but things that still apply are we have to do COVID testing with the athletes and all staff three times a week. Uh, and one of those tests has to be within 48 hours of a game based on our conferences guidelines. Um, so for us to be able to participate in our season, in our conference, we have to be following these guidelines that they propose for us. Um, we have daily forms that the athletes must fill out before they're allowed to enter the facilities that asks about uh, their symptoms and any uh, kind of contact they may have come into with others that were experiencing symptoms or uh, may have been known to come in contact with others that could have been positive or in uh, places that have found to have positive cases. Um, this tied into their normal questionnaires as well. And then they have to have their temperature checked as well before they enter the facilities. Um, again, we have our normal questionnaires for readiness and training loads based on after training. Uh, totally normal process there and then collecting GPS data as normal as well because Again, if we want them to be training and we want to, them to be doing everything the way we normally would to prepare them for training and, and competing for their season in their games, we need to be getting all that same data again. Some stuff within the gym has been affected because gym access is still not completely normal. Um, we have limits to how many people are allowed in the gym at a single time. Um, and we have some equipment at a practice field with the soccer team. So most of our lifting is actually done outside um, with some equipment we have there rather than inside the gym. So there's a few pieces of technology we haven't been using, but we still use uh, some of the things that have been most impactful for our group specifically. So with men's soccer, we're still using the Nord board to track our hamstring forces. Um, and this happens on a weekly basis to make sure we're seeing where they are compared uh, week by week um, based on each week of training that goes by and making sure everyone is kind of still in a spot based on their normal, based on recent trends that we're comfortable with and, and we understand kind of how they are responding to their training based on all these other pieces of data. And then again, looking at all of these different data uh, points based on how they looked compared to our previous spring season before we got uh, shut down because of the beginning of this, and then also how they looked in that previous fall season. So that's kind of the biggest change in uh, how the data has been looked at, at least leading into the season, was more so the frame at how we looked at it, um, especially with the Nord board data and the uh, GPS data, uh, how these things compare to how they were before all of this downtime leading up to our preseason and everything coming into this now new season. Uh, you know, where were they compared, or where are they now compared to where they were before we got shut down, where they were kind of the last time we consider them to be, uh, you know, at their peak physical form or at their kind of peak readiness to perform. Where are they compared to that? Um, so here is just a quick view of some tables we use to look at the Nord board data. It's a little bit crazy when you first look at it, um, but it's giving just kind of a quick uh, color-coded look at how their data compares to where they normally are um, and then how they compare to some of their numbers from the past spring. So we were doing this on a weekly basis in the spring as well, getting an idea for where they are normally, what their best numbers look like, and using some colors just give a quick idea so that you can understand where it is without having to fully understand all of the numbers exactly. So green on the most left side of this uh, graph being above their average, yellow being below average, red being uh, about 10% or more below average, and dark red being 20% or more below average. Um, so at first, the biggest thing was where do they lay, or where does this data fall compared to the spring? You know, we had our data from where they were when they started the spring season, ready to compete. When they come in at the start of this preseason, uh, if we want them to be ready to perform, we have to be able to at least get them to that point, because if they're not there, we can't expect them to be ready to perform at a high level. Um, so most of these guys coming in, we had uh, 
a about a month, month and a half period of just strict conditioning beforehand, uh, on soccer related, just kind of running uh, type training related to um, how it pertains to the physical characteristics and demands of soccer. So um, running specific to how we can train them for the demands of soccer, but not doing any uh, soccer related training activities such as stuff with the ball or normal drills they would have in our practice, just focusing purely on preparing their body from a conditioning standpoint for what they will eventually do when they get back to training. Um, same thing with stuff in the gym, just kind of preparing them, kind of rebuilding them from stage one to be prepared for when they get back to normal training. And then once we get to that point, where do these numbers fall so we can understand how we need to tailor that training to make sure that from now until the season started, um, how can we then make sure we're not overloading them and we're kind of giving them an appropriate amount of training to build them at the right pace to make sure we get to the season feeling good and we're at a point that they're you know, not going to be at an unnecessary risk for injury and they're going to be uh, ready for the demands of their sport. Because again, normally they train all the time. To go a few months with no training is very, uh, you know, some athletes had never done that before in their entire careers. So how do we then prepare them to go back to their sport after all that time? We need to make sure that we build them back up again to, and prepare them for the demands before they're actually in that situation. Um, so here we got a quick view of a particular week some people were in the yellow, but a lot of times the yellow is kind of very minorly below their average, so it's not necessarily uh, a dangerous situation per se, um, but it's something to just know maybe they're a bit fatigued from training. Uh, let's just make sure we're keeping track of how they're feeling, looking at their questionnaires, talking to them about how they feel, watching their training loads in practice to make sure we're keeping everything on track. And that when we test this the next time, we're, you know, we're not moving in the wrong direction. Asymmetries in that middle column where it says average and balance here. Um, looking at that, that's just a percent uh, imbalance towards one way or the other. Um, the positive numbers being right side being higher, negative numbers being left side being higher. Um, the white is, you know, being in an acceptable range, green being a very, very good range yellow again being, you know, in a range that we want to start paying attention to and red being something we don't want to see. So there we're pretty good. Asymmetries aren't so bad. Um, some people aren't exactly at optimal forces there, but at the same time, if they're training, they're getting into kind of a normal routine. They're not always going to be at their best because to train, they have to get fatigued so that they can adapt to those demands of the sport. Um, what we don't want to see is sometimes they start to dip a little bit too low. And when you see kind of a general trend like this across the team, then we have to say, all right, what is our approach going to be to make sure this doesn't continue to move in this direction? Um, so we get a handful of guys now in the red well below their averages, a lot of guys in the yellow, not too many guys sitting in the green now. And a key thing to note is that now the right side still has a fair amount of people in the green. Uh, and we're seeing a lot more people in the yellow and a few reds for the imbalances. So right sides aren't necessarily that much worse than they were before, roughly similar on average, but the left side dropped a lot. So a lot of the guys on the team are right side dominant. We'll see that when they do get fatigued, we get bigger imbalances because their left sides are dropping down and getting really fatigued um, from whether it's being used in a weird way because they're always trying to play with their right side. Um, some people will drop more so on their dominant side because it may be used more. So it's not always um, the same trends within everyone or always a, one particular trend that we see. Um, but when we do see things like this, like asymmetries getting bigger, one particular side dropping a lot, we need to then pay attention to what's happening, pay attention to how athletes are recovering, how days are being uh, kind of structured on top of each other in terms of the training load so that we don't push too hard um, for either particular athletes or the squad as a whole. 
so that we can get this back under control and make sure we're, co we're recovering so that when we get to games and we need them to perform, we're not asking them to do anything that is putting them at an unnecessary risk or something that they're not prepared or ready to actually do. Um, again, now we're kind of further down the line uh, with our season and we're a little bit past the point of um, needing to look at last spring or the fall before um, because now we're, we're at a pretty good physical point here. We can see um, our most recent team averages with our Nord board data is actually uh, not too bad in terms of some of the fluctuations. We see some stuff move up and down here and there, but generally the team averages are pretty stable. Um, but we can also look at particular particular athletes. And here we can see, you know, when a particular athlete starts to get pretty fatigued, you know, we'll see some uh, trends there where their data starts to drop. Um, and then we'll see that imbalance jump up. So sometimes it's not necessarily a straight red flag where we have to then, you know, limit that athlete or anything, but it's always something that we then need to pay attention to and make sure, all right, Let's pay attention to the training loads on this athlete, talk to them, see how they're feeling, make sure everything's good, make sure that there's nothing um, particular to, uh, you know, if it's an athlete that's typically uh, at risk for a particular injury, whether it's hamstrings or, or anything like that, um, and make sure that we're still moving in the right direction so that we don't lose sight of anything and we can make sure, again, they're, they're going to be ready to perform when they need to be. Um, and then again, coming back to our predictive analysis and clustering. Um, so we saw one view of the learning tree model before, where we're trying to take that questionnaire data coming in uh, and that GPS data coming in to then try and understand what the trends look like on a normal basis based on a particular day, and then look at how they may respond the next day. And if we see where we think they may be responding in a way that is not what we're looking for or not what we would expect, how can we then maybe preemptively plan ahead to try and uh, adjust training or adjust um, the work in the gym uh, to then make sure that when they get to the next game or we get to a day that's supposed to be hard, they're ready for that challenge, they're ready for that uh, stress on their body and it's not going to overload them or put them at again at any unnecessary risk. Um, and then another thing that we're trying to use is a cluster analysis, um, doing it through what's called a DB scan or a density based spatial clustering of applications with noise. So as you can imagine data coming in from team sports and, and uh, a place where there's a lot of different uh, environmental factors and things that we can't necessarily control for or account for. There's always going to be a lot of noise in the data, things that uh, we can't account for, things that are going to make it look messy, and uh, things that are always going to uh, make things like prediction not work 100% the way we want them to. Uh, how can we try and make sense of some of that data and understand it uh, from a different perspective? So one way we're trying to do that is take some of our uh, data from our different training sessions and whether it's take uh, particular drills and cluster them out based on the GPS data looking at, all right, if we're trying to look at drills that cover a lot of distance or uh, a lot of high speed distance, where do they fall compared to drills that may end up covering uh, a lot of time in that red zone for their heart rate or other different GPS variables. How can we then understand that to then understand how uh, when we structure training, how the coaches come to us with a training plan for that day, what we might expect the session to be like based on what drills were chosen for that day, how that data typically is from past sessions, and how we might expect that session to kind of play out based on uh, how those drills fall, what their data normally looks like, and and what they typically may be heavy on, again, whether it's distance, high-speed distance, impacts, any of those variables that we tend to look at a lot of the time. Uh, and again, the main goal just being have the most kind of comprehensive understanding of the data that's coming in so that we can, uh, you know, make sense of that data, bring it to the coaches, look at it ourselves, talk to athletes about it to 
try and best inform all of us and create this big overview of how we can then move forward and how we can then better how we structure training, how we structure um, everything that goes into preparing them to perform so that we can understand what demands are on them uh, and understand how we can then more optimally uh, place those stresses on athletes or help them recover from those stresses so that they can be prepared to perform at their best when they need to. Um, so from there, that's basically it for me. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I know some of that is kind of quick and there's a lot more kind of to it, but um, if anybody has any questions here or anything that they'd like to bring up, I'm happy to answer any of those questions. Great, hey, Chris, great conversation. Yes, we do have a few questions. So the first question was by Sharon. Are the athletes agreeable to filling out their questionnaires? Do you think there's any reluctance in, in them being completely honest in their answers? Are they all on board with this? Yeah, so um, they before we give them anything such as questionnaires, normally um, it's kind of part of their uh, being on the team is that they're open to kind of do those things. Um, it's kind of part of their agreement when they come onto the team with their coaches, because uh, their coaches obviously want that information, but at the same time, we do kind of like to go through and kind of inform them why we like to collect this data and how it can be important for them, how it can affect them and, and why we see value in it so that hopefully they can kind of see that same value. There definitely are always athletes that are uh, not necessarily reluctant, but uh, don't necessarily kind of invest into it as much as we may like. Uh, athletes that always have to be reminded to fill it out or uh, don't necessarily put the effort into it we would like, you know, putting the same responses all the time, you know, regardless of how they feel or they, you know, fill out that they don't really have soreness on their questionnaire, but then when we talk to them, they're complaining about something bothering them. You know, then we have to go back and say, all right, well, how come that wasn't on your questionnaire? You know, we ask these questions because we want to know this stuff. We double check with you. We want that information to kind of be along the same lines and, and you know, make the same kind of picture for us in the end. Um, so that's part of the reason why we also want to restructure a new questionnaire so that it, it feels like it's something that they help design. It feels like it's something that's based on how they understand their bodies and, and what we're going through on a daily basis so that they may feel a little more connected to it and, and be a little more willing to put the time and effort into it to understand why it's important and how it helps us and them in the end. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I was just about to point out that your new questionnaires might help there, right? You know, hundred percent. Yeah, that's what you're trying to find out in the sense. You know, are they just answering for the sake of answering, or are they really seriously taking it? Um, for sure. Is there any instrumentation that they that you would use to measure? You know, for example, soreness or body aches or anything like that. Like a like you know Apple Watch provides some facilities nowadays, or any of the smart watches. Are are some of your athletes required to use any of that? Um, so not necessarily. Um, normally, that like all their questionnaires and stuff are done on their phone. Um, so some of it is a little more intuitive in that sense, so they can just kind of pick up their phone and do it. But in terms of measuring stuff like soreness. Um, some athletes will have kind of their own individual stuff, whether it's an Apple Watch or anything like that, but there's nothing necessarily provided to them that is kind of a, a team-wide or department-wide uh, kind of consistent thing there. Um, so there are some athletes where we may get something like that, but I would say mostly if we're trying to look further into aspects such as that, we'll use things such as the Nord board, or other things that we'll collect with them to kind of get that other dimension of the information to say, all right, well, they said they're kind of sore today. When we did our most recent Nord board, their forces may have been a little bit low. You know, maybe that's in line with what's happening on the field. We can track their training loads, uh, how they may be responding and recovering from those things to try and, again, kind of create that whole picture to understand what's going on. 
And then we do have kind of our sports medicine department that they'll see if they have any aches and pains, they'll go to them, they'll get assessed, they'll get any treatments, and then I'll kind of work with our team specific athletic trainer to go through any of that stuff and kind of keep developing our approach for those athletes that may be either returning from an injury or, or be kind of on that watch list per se. Okay, one, one more question. Great presentation, Chris. Thank you. This is from Kent Wolf. Uh, you're shown the video of soccer athletes making use of the system. Have you incorporated this with other sports at NC State also? Um, so right now, the main team we have focused on was men's soccer. Just we were collecting the most kind of different data sources and using it uh, the most on a daily basis with them. Uh, the goal is to kind of branch it out to a bunch of other teams as we continue to develop moving forward. Um, as of now, uh, women's basketball is also using GPS devices, um, and uh, women's soccer was eventually going to get into it this year with COVID and everything going on, affecting department budgets and all that sort of stuff has kind of put a lot of that sort of stuff on halt. Uh, but the, again, the goal is to eventually apply a lot of these uh, processes and kind of approaches to other sports as well once we kind of develop our plan uh, for what data we want to collect, how we want to collect it with those other teams. Got it, got it. So here we are now coming back to the topic of COVID-19. I, I remember, you know, a few months back when I spoke to you, you spoke about some of the precautions that you were taking with regard to COVID-19 and how the students actually uh, came back to campus and, so, you, know, you know, how their whole entire system had changed when they came back to campus. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, so went through some of these stuff, such as the extra questionnaire stuff about the symptom management, uh, taking temperatures as they come in. Um, in terms of facility access, again, they can only come in if they fill that stuff out and they go through that process. Um, and then again, facility access through the day is pretty limited to, you know, a, a window of training or practice. Um, you know, they're not allowed to kind of freely just come through the building when they would like as they were in the past, whether it's, you know, come down to our gym to grab something from the nutrition station or talk and meet with coaches. Everything kind of has to be done within specific time windows for a specific day, and they're trying to limit uh, kind of the traffic in and out of our facilities um, so that there isn't just kind of people around all the time. And then obviously when you're in facilities, you're always having to wear masks or buffs. Um, we've provided that stuff to all the athletes and staff as well. So, you know, when you're in facilities, you have to have that stuff on. When we're going out to practice and, and talking with the team as a group, they have to have that stuff on. While they're in the middle of practice in particular drills, the athletes themselves don't have to necessarily have the masks on, but they always have their buffs around their necks or on them so that when we stop and we are talking as a group or anything like that, everyone has their buffs and masks on. Uh, and then uh, really the only time that they have the luxury of not having uh, their kind of protective stuff there is when they're in the middle of stuff during practice or a game. Otherwise, it's, you know, we're taking those precautions, wearing their masks and buffs, and then, you know, uh, really being careful with how the facilities are being used. Um, and again, like before, normally they'd be using the gym for any training for you know lifting and stuff like that, but we as a as a soccer team have been outside using the equipment outside just so that we can free up some of that gym time for the teams that don't have that luxury uh, because not everyone has that equipment outside to use. Um, so for us, it's changed how you know what what we can do in specific lifting workouts, how those will be structured, and how those are planned out um, so that we can still kind of hit some of the goals that we want to. Uh, you know, go upon to make sure that they're prepared for when they are training for soccer um, and, you know, how we can still get those things accomplished when we're not using some of the stuff that we have in the gym, but we don't have outside. Great. I, I think you guys do a fantastic job. I mean, this, this is hard even for you too, right? You know, you got to make all the adjustments and bring it all together in a very, I feel, systematic manner. Uh, one more, one more question. Ted Waterby, has the data shown reduced injuries following the implementation of data collection and resulting training modifications? 
Um, so it's always hard to say um, whether or not we're kind of reducing or eliminating any injuries. We like to kind of say or, um, that, you know, it's helping us work on things that may be related to injury, but again, we'll never know whether or not an injury was prevented or um, didn't happen because of what we did. Um, but we do kind of pay attention to things that we may be considered as related to injury or related to kind of putting athletes in risky situations. So we do feel like doing a lot of things like using the NOR board um, will give us uh, a dimension to the data that provides us a perspective to say, you know, we, we can see when athletes may be dipping into an area that we've kind of seen be related to injury or related to an athlete being kind of at risk because they're well below their normal. They may be really fatigued and, and within a muscle group that has been related to a lot of injuries within soccer specifically. Um, so how we can just make sure that those things are kind of being handled well and are in kind of a, you know, comfortable bandwidth of where they normally are so that we can try and, you know, keep tailoring our training uh, and uh, managing our training loads to make sure that those things stay kind of within that range. Now, sometimes they can be in a good range and someone gets hurt. Sometimes they could be in a bad range and someone doesn't get hurt. We can't necessarily always uh, keep everything completely under control and explain every situation that plays out. Um, but we feel like it does uh, kind of help us avoid putting athletes at unnecessary risk and putting them in situations that um, you know, may be uh, overstressing something like their hamstrings or, or any other muscle group that can be uh, one that's of interest within soccer players. Yeah, yeah, oh, great, great answer. So one, f I think this is going to be the final question. Right. Sorry, I can actually kind of say that you know, it, it kind of plays into like with our sports medicine team, how we uh, kind of track our return to play. So we'll use some of those measures if someone does get hurt uh, to see how they're comparing to where they normally are, how we can slowly build them back up to that point. Uh, and say, all right, well, now we can get them back to that baseline. Now they may be prepared to get back to normal training or they're not quite there. What can we continue to do to progress them to move forward so that we can get them to a point where we can now say, all right, they they should be ready to be in normal training or or be able to do a little bit more so that they can start preparing to be back in normal training or normal competition. Great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I think we are running out of time. Fantastic presentation. Again, you know, uh, you've been such a great supporter of us, HPCC Systems, as well as, you know, uh, just uh, going out there and doing conferences for us and talking about sports med medicine in general and the analytics that you're doing. I think it's going to be extremely helpful for our folks all over the place. Thank you. Thank you for the contribution. And uh, everybody else, make sure you're, you're present for the main sessions. We still have some very key topics that we're going to be talking about. So uh, it's going to start in the next uh, five or 10 minutes. Great, guys. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you.